Welcome in, everybody, to another edition of the Go 24-7 podcast. My name is Matthew Bruni, and today, once again, uh, with me is Shay Dixon. Shay, how are you doing this morning? Doing well. Um, I think LSU, most LSU fans are feeling better waking up today than they did the, the prior two Sundays of the football season, so that makes it better for people like you and I who have to hang out all day talking about how the team's doing. Yeah, uh, like progressively, it's gotten better. You had the UCLA point. And then you get the little McNeese bump. You're like, okay, maybe it's possible. And then you have Central Michigan where we, we it's not an SEC win, but nonetheless, it's a win, uh, a convincing win. Nonetheless, 49 to 21 over Central Michigan at home on Saturday night at Tiger Stadium. Um, by far the best performance of this LSU team so far this year. Uh, we have a lot of different angles we can go on to, to do these takeaways less than 12 hours after the end of the game. But where do you want to start us off with? Well, I think you summed it up well. It is just from Michigan, but it was a step up in competition. And we had said all week, we did podcasts on this. We heard local radio. We heard Orgeron talk about it. If LSU sleepwalks through this game and lets them hang around till halftime, this is a game you could end up losing. And they were a 19-point favorite for a reason. LSU should be beating Central Michigan by a few touchdowns. They did that. They came out from the start. I think the game was over within five minutes, really. I mean, they had – a touchdown immediately on the first drive of the game. They immediately force a, a scoop and score off of a fumble. And it's 14 nothing before you blink your eyes. So we'll get into a few of the nuances here and much more of it, you know, on Monday after we talk to Orgeron and, and have sort of the final review pod. But I will say that if I'm going to knock them for little things they do wrong, even against the McNeese's of the world, uh, I've got to give some credit to what I saw on Saturday night against Central Michigan. Uh, well said by you. A convincing win, which is exactly what LSU needed. Yeah, the game started off real quickly. I mean, with Max Johnson, the first play of the game, he throws into double coverage, just kind of a lofted ball. And we were like, "Oh boy, uh, I'm not sure how this is gonna go." And it wasn't intercepted; it was batted down. And then later in the possession, he had a couple of nice passes to Jack Besh, and then uh, he throws that jump ball up to Deion Smith, and Deion Smith makes. The play of the season so far with a tremendous grab over the Central Michigan cornerback. And that kind of set the tone for the fireworks. I think I put that in my recap. That kind of just, I feel like that loosened everybody up. It just really started to let people um, go from there. And that's when you had the uh, Derek Stingley uh, fumble. And then uh, Andre Anthony picks it up and returns it for a touchdown. And at that point, it was just, it was over for Central Michigan. Because the whole time Central Michigan to Missouri they were in the game, you know, they were in, they were in distance with Missouri and they were able to run the ball and they were able to establish themselves. Once, once uh, LSU took the lead and, you know, started to control the game, it was pretty much over at that point. So you're going, my only takeaway, I had to stop listening after I heard it because you're going with Dion Smith's Smith Moss moment over the Jack Besh one handed. TD. I am. I am. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think the Deion Smith yeah, one. Enough, enough. I think the I think the Deion Smith one was just impressive from a uh I, I mean the Jack Bash one was difficult, obviously, but I feel like it kind of just fell into him there. Deion Smith went and got it, and I was like I was just shocked at that. Well, I guess that's a good place to start and kind of maybe sum up the offense tonight is Max had what five or last night. Max had 372 yards, five touchdowns, 75% passer. He'll want the very last one he had back. He misread uh, what Coy Moore was doing there, and they end up getting a pick six. But the game's well in hand at that point. He'll see it on film. And we're talking about Deion Smith and Jack Besh. We're arguing about those two guys within two minutes of the pod and who had the better touchdown catch. I think that sums up uh, the youth movement we saw. Those two guys and Brian Thomas were the three leading receivers in terms of yardage uh, in the game. Keishon Butte had a touchdown as well. Uh, and then you look at the leading running back was Corey Kiner. All of these guys just signed. All of these guys are true freshmen. And they made a very concerted effort, which I asked O about after the game. And he said, look, when we met as staff this week, it became clear. Put the best players on the field. If, they're, if you don't think they're completely ready for these spots, let's find out. And uh, they put Jack Besh in the starting lineup. They put Deion Smith in the starting lineup. Uh, we saw more of Corey Kiner as the game went on. Now you wonder if he's going to move into the starting lineup. Uh, by far, at least on offense, your skill players now are freshmen and sophomores that it seems they need to be leaning on. And I think that's what gave people a little bit of hope last night that, 
hey, look, there are some tools around Max Johnson. They got to figure out the O line. They got to figure out the run game. But we knew all these receivers were great. Well, let's see how good this freshman class you signed really is. We got a taste of it last night. I think those guys combined for like 200 and something yards. Devonta Lee had his breakout game in an LSU uniform. So it was a complete shift from what we'd seen. Trey Palmer didn't dress out. Dre Jenkins dressed out and didn't even get out there, really. Coy Moore didn't get out there until the end of the game. He played some of the uh, return game as well. Uh, but it was very clear, Matt, that they wanted to see what these freshmen had to offer. And now moving forward, you would think those guys are probably about to replace the vets in the lineup. Yeah, and to go off of that, uh, Max Johnson kind of answered the questions for a lot of people. I felt like he settled into the game uh, pretty well after that first drive, which I thought was a little shaky. He got better as the game progressed, ended with gaudy numbers, just incredible numbers, uh, which I don't know if they told the whole story, but, you know, five touchdowns, 372 yards, you know, tells enough of the story to know that he was good. And... I'm I'm still not completely sold on him, but it was the performance we needed to see. Like we needed to see. We said coming in, we were like Central Michigan. He has to perform. Like they have to be able to move the ball vertically. They have to be able to get the ball down the field. And even though, if you want to say some throws are questionable, I mean the second touchdown to Deion Smith was not questionable. It was a really good ball down the right sideline, and it was in his bread basket, and he scored for a touchdown. I mean he had some good throws. He found Jack Best several times. He was under control, and that's. That's the big thing for this offense is to have Max Johnson comfortable now moving forward. And I think you touched on it as well. The offensive line held up pretty well. Uh, Troy Harrison was pretty much shut out uh, for Central Michigan. Their defense line wasn't able to get much pressure. And, um, yeah, the offensive line is, is another big uh, takeaway for me. Yeah, I mean, kudos to the offensive line. I think getting Chase and Hines and Austin Deckles back was really key last night. And it's two of your starters. And, look, you can knock these guys and say, well, you know, they're not – they're seniors and they still make bad plays here and there, whatever it is, they're way better options than having to rush in or push in some of these yeah. backups. And then Xavier Hill now, two weeks in a row, has been the guy who started at left tackle. Last night he was the last of the, you know, quote unquote backups who was still starting because Cam Wire was out. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's good to see that they're figuring out something with Hill and developing him. You could see he settled in more last night. Uh, I thought that oh did a good job of summing up after the game. If you want to read all of his uh, quotes, his transcript from uh, his post-game press conference, we've got it up on the website. But he said as much as playing all of these true freshmen were uh, at receiver and putting them in at running back, and as great as Max looked, it all came back to protection. And not only did the O-line play better, but he felt like Jake Pete's called a better game to hide some of the issues that were going on with the O-line. I'd have to agree. This is clearly Pete's best game uh, of his young OC career, uh, and you know that he's learning on the fly a bit. But uh, in this game, I think he stuck to the reality that we need to go tempo, we need to play these young guys, uh, and we need to scheme it up a little bit better. And I thought that for the first time this season, right, Matt, that we saw LSU choosing what they're doing and dictating what was happening and the defense having to react from there as opposed to the check with me offense where, as Max said, after the, the McNeese game, we're doing check with me. Well, they're checking our checks. By the time we even get it in, we're having to then scramble and just get it off with a few seconds left. Yeah. They looked way more comfortable on offense tonight. Um, again, O-line, you'll have to figure out this running game. But, and for whatever reason, why ever Ty Davis-Price doesn't look like the kind of guy he looked as a sophomore and as a freshman. Uh, and even in the spring, he had a really nice spring game where he, he had some big runs. It's been Corey Kiner now as a true freshman who stepped in. Uh, and clearly, Matt, I think he – he didn't have a ton of run in the first half, but when he got started to get in there in the third quarter, it was clear he had a little wiggle to him. He started to feel good about him again, and they let him just take him home from there. I mean, Nussmeyer had gotten into the game. Um, he ran around a bit, threw it downfield a bit, but really they were trying to give Corey Kiner some touches, and boy, a stiff arm, a spin move for a touchdown. Yeah. He looks like he's settling in as someone that I don't know if he's starting because you'll watch when they're throwing the football – Josh Williams and TDP are out there because they know what to do in the pass blocking game. But certainly Corey Kiner knows how to find a hole, hit a hole, uh, make a guy miss. And, and they need some of that right now uh, as the run game struggles. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how the run game continues to develop and if they can, like what ceiling is on it, how much can they improve it even with um, 
the offensive line and just uh, whether it's TDP, Corey Kine, or Monty Goodwin, whoever they want to put out there running back. I'm interested to watch that. On defense, though, I was once again just very impressed with the defense's performance. I thought the defense defensive line, in my opinion, just dominated the game from from the start. I think uh, the major Burns interception was a lot of a lot of that was pressure on Sermon, and Sermon was kind of throwing off his back foot, just hoping heaving and he threw an interception uh they stopped the run i mean Mich- central michigan ends up running for 56 yards on 31 carries uh it was just a dominant performance from that defense line jaquelin roy i mean we know the names at this point mason smith you got on the list of players andre anthony before he got hurt bj ojalari great game from the defense line and this defense line after i want to i don't want to say a shaky first game in ucla it was you know maybe not as dynamic as we had hoped uh they have just completely dominated the last two games and which is a good sign going into conf- uh, to conference play. Yeah. We didn't really talk about this a ton and granted it was, it skewed a bit because they had nine sacks versus McNeese, but they entered the week with the, uh, I think 12 sacks, 12, 13 sacks, but it tied for the first in the NCAA. And I think mm-hmm. they had five more last night or Jerome said after the game, I thought we'd have more, <clears throat> excuse me, just, and he's probably basing that off seeing Missouri rack up 10 sacks. Uh, yeah. But LSU sitting like right at 17 sacks in three games. That's a great number. That's going to be one, if not top five, number in the uh, in the NCAA after three weeks. So they're finding out ways to get home. And, and I know you'll talk about this in a second because you did the film study uh, and kind of circled uh, Troy Harrison and then uh, that Central Michigan D-line, which has some big boys in the middle. Um, oh, excuse me. I, I started thinking about the D-line. I'm, I want to flip that. LSU's D-line. I thought mm-hmm. that, and you talked about, you did the film game on the run game uh, and what CMU was able to do against Missouri. We were, yeah. heard Orgeron say it multiple times this week. Orgeron said, look, we they can run the football and they're going to want to run the football to try to stick in this game. So we got to be really sound, play our best football. Did they, I think they did two things really, really well. They played good, sound, kind of technique-wise, gap assignments, whatever you want to put into that category of things you can kind of control as a defensive lineman, as a front seven, they all checked the box there and everybody was tackling. I mean, there weren't many missed tackles last night, uh, whether it was the D line, the second level, the DBs, uh, everyone across the board pretty much turned in a strong night uh, in terms of tackling, which had been an issue for them in spots so far this season. Now look, they'll want to clean up these coverage busts. I mean, it's in week one, it's the crossing routes and week, Two, they don't do anything. You're playing McNeese. In week three, uh, you know, you have guys running wide open again uh, on some busted assignments. One notably where uh, the game was, I think it was still in the first half, obviously. So starters were in there. Stingley lets his man run behind him. Uh, it was Major Burns who should have then been there playing the safety coverage over the top. Uh, Major Burns sort of drifted into no man's land in the middle of the field. And Central Michigan just pops it. That's easy for them. And, and a touchdown. Uh, so Burns will see that, that on film. They'll have to continue to clean that that stuff up. I mean, O was pissed after the game. He was like, that's not acceptable to yeah. just have complete yeah. coverage busts of just not playing the right assignment. That's something you can control out there before the snap, knowing where you're supposed to be. So I think they'll get that cleaned up. Boy, I already watched some of the game again this morning. Joe Evans looked like the Joe Evans that O talked about all offseason when he said, look, one of our best D linemen is Joe Evans. A lot of these guys can get after the quarterback, but nobody can really stop the run like Joe Evans. We just didn't see much of it in the first two games. He was everywhere against the Central Michigan run last night. Uh, you mentioned guys like Anthony Alden played well. Anthony goes down with an injury. That'll be like a massive storyline now this week of what yeah. happened because Definitely. he's one of the best kids in the program. Six-year guy, finally settled in, hand in the dirt, defensive end. And we're talking about how talented they are on the D-line. He's been by far their best one. He's been better than Mason Smith. I mean, his numbers are the best. He's the leader in the room. Uh, and now it looks like he's going to be looking at, you would hope, a sprained uh, MCL or some sort of you know minor, minor knee uh, injury like that. It's more of a scare uh, and nothing more serious. But we'll find out. I-, I thought, though, that my takeaway, they tackled great, Matthew, but I thought that, boy, just the run game in general and the ability to stop the run game, to hold Central Michigan to, like, 1.1 yards per rush at halftime and I think under two for the game uh, even when you toss in the end of the game and you got backups in there I just thought they were dialed in the whole time and, and that was a big reason they looked good and won the game yeah it was so refreshing it was refreshing to see that and um 
though to to kind of wrap up the point on the defensive line, I think you you mentioned it where you know Coach o was like we should have more than five sacks because Miss or he didn't say this, but Missouri had nine or ten, and the difference was Missouri was constantly bringing pressure, like bringing linebackers, bringing corners in. They were blitzing Central Michigan. LSU doesn't need to do that. LSU just brings four, and they hit home a lot. And that's a big deal going into conference play. Like that is that is a major plus for this defense to be able to not have to bring linebackers that consistently to 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 manufacture pressure. They just hit with four. And if that's the case, that makes life really easy on a lot of other players on this defense because you don't have to worry about, all right, this time the nickel is going to come in um, off the edge. This time the Michael Baskerville is going to come in. and But so, Damone, you have to step over and take his area. It just simplifies a lot of things. If the four can get can get there, I mean, that's just a basic, you know, rule of football. If you can hit a home with four, it just makes it easy. So uh, that's what I'm interested in to see if that translates to the SEC, if they can just hit home with four and get pressure on the quarterback. That's a big deal. And um, that makes life easier on the linebackers. And I think the linebackers played their best game of the year. I mean, by far, honestly, like, it, it wasn't even close. Baskerville and Clark, I thought, played really good games. Strong, I think, had six tackles as well. Uh, the linebackers played a strong game, and uh, that's that's a that might be the most like surprising thing of this whole thing is the linebackers show that they they're they're capable of being solid, if not good, at times. Sorry, I myself muted there. Yeah, we uh, Baskerville, Clark. I mean, I think those two had two of their better games. You're seeing Bug Strong really come along more and more. The curious case is Mike Jones. We'll see how much they actually use him. Uh, when they get into SEC play or, or if he's still not where they need him to be. But uh, I'm with you. I thought that the linebackers had another solid game. I thought, and we're kind of wrapping up here, so I'll give so, sort of some overarching thoughts before we kind of weigh in on, on moving into Mississippi State and SEC week. But they had – so, and I mentioned this before the game, and uh, a couple of my buddies who are into gambling spreads were all saying, especially leading up to this game, hey, look, LSU's ripe to cover this 19. Like, they should be beating a Central Michigan by – three touchdowns and they come out and play with energy and do all the things that they did. It was comfortably that sort of win. I think they, you pointed out, there's only a, a moment there midway through the fourth quarter where you wondered, Oh wait, are they about to get this to 21 points? But as for the net yeah. result, it was never in question that LSU was going to win it. It was also clear before the game that like suddenly they had a lot of guys back healthy. I mean, and I know losing Andrew, Andre Anthony or at least for that game, and then we'll see what happens with him is terrible. You hate it, but Coming into this game, Dwight McGlother, and you're, you know, really your second or third best corner if you're not including Flott yeah. uh, as a guy who plays on the outside, but behind Stingley and Ricks, he makes his debut. Malik Neighbors at wide receiver makes his debut. Um, Matthew Langlois dressed for the first time. Um, you know, you get Hines and Deculus back on the O line. Uh, I, there's, I'm, oh, Todd Harris is back out there. Uh, we'll see if they get Jay Ward back next week. So a team that's really been decimated by injuries in a big way in fall camp, which I think hurt the continuity as a team, uh, kind of right after the UCLA game. They're starting to get healthy again. I think that's really key for them uh, moving into this Mississippi State stretch. And, and look, I'll say, here, what are the next games, Matt? Mississippi State, Kentucky, Auburn. And yep. State got beat by Memphis yesterday – correct in a it's, pretty wild yeah, it's Mississippi State, it's Mississippi then Kentucky then Florida wait uh, is is oh, wait uh, Auburn right is Auburn's in that mix yeah it's Mississippi State Auburn Kentucky then Florida oh okay okay I didn't hear you say Auburn yeah okay so what state lost to Memphis Auburn played a great game with Penn State but Bo Nix still doesn't uh, that looked like road game Bo Nix uh, and then you look at Kentucky as a team that like it definitely, I think, could run with LSU, no doubt. But we were propping them up a bit as a talented team. They sneaked by Chattanooga uh, yesterday. So uh, I'm not into the whole transitive property. Who beat who? <laughs> Look, Fresno State, Fresno State beats UCLA last night in a great game uh, that yeah. came down in the fourth quarter. Now Fresno is a team that just had lost to Oregon only by seven. They were winning in the fourth quarter. Uh, and now they get a huge win over UCLA. It's tough already to play and i say i don't play the transitive property game but it's so tough to even try to play it right now because you don't know how good state auburn kentucky are because we've seen them have some real highs and some real lows uh to start this season maybe not so much auburn as much as the other two but um i think you leave here's the thing for lsu fans 
you leave the weekend feeling better about LSU's chances moving forward in the in the very near future with these three games we mentioned coming up than you probably did going into that game or going into the weekend as a whole before you saw all those teams. Uh, so I think that's what you'll take out of this weekend. You'll take LSU moving up a little bit and the other teams kind of pulling themselves back down to earth some. Yeah. The the big thing to me to bounce off of that is it looked like a team that was competent. It looked like for the first time, it looked like they had the foundation for a successful SEC team. And that's something that we had kind of questions about. Like, how, where's the path for success with this LSU team coming out of two weeks? It was like, they can't run the ball. The offense looks inept. The, the defense has given up big plays. It looks like they are starting to understand what they are and what they're good at. Like, the defensive line, we know is going to be elite. We know it's a top, what, three defensive line in, in the conference, three, four defensive line in the conference. Um, the secondary, I mean, just if you look at the corners, the corners have been able to do their jobs. Have they been perfect? No, but you understand how the defense is going to be able to get stops in the SEC. Um, and the linebackers also, I mean, you have to give credit to them as well. They look like they're figuring it out as the season progresses, which is big. This is a team that we might have underestimated how much work they had to do going into the season. But now coming off of week three, this is a win that can give them some momentum and help them understand that, all right, this is how we can win games in the SEC. We don't maybe don't need to run the ball. We're going to try to run the ball, but you know, if we don't run the ball, we can quick pass, we can RPO, we can jet sweep. There's a lot of options we can do off of that um, to supplement the run. And we can give Max Johnson options. Now, a lot of this is dependent on giving Max Johnson time, but now we know they have the receivers. We know they have the playmakers uh, to compete in the SEC. So there's just a lot of things that were shown this week that are going to give the team confidence and going to give them a foundation for success in the SEC. And that's that's the big thing for me is that this isn't just a win because it's Central Michigan. It's like, all right, cool, it happened. No, this is this is something that foundationally is, is a big win and a big moment for this team moving forward. Yeah, and kudos again. Look, I thought Jake Peets, I thought Durante Jones – if I'm going to knock them in these first few weeks, i got to give them credit when it's due. I thought they yeah. both had really good game plans coming in, and they both had their kids executing it well. I'm with you. I think that sums it up well. Don't take this game as saying, okay, look, LSU's back. Like, they should be beating Central Michigan by 24 points. That's what they go out and do or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, they should beat State. That's what they'll go out and do. They should beat Kentucky and Auburn. That's what they'll go out and do. Uh, we're not saying any of that. I'm certainly not. Uh, but I agree with Matthew in that now you at least say a week ago there was you were having to really try to convince yourself how are they going to beat these SEC teams if they can't run the football, they can't protect Max, they don't have anybody beyond Butte doing anything at receiver. And, you know, the only good team they played on defensively, at least, uh, if we're tossing out McNeese, UCLA ran up and down the field on them, throwing it wide to wide open guys or uh, messing them up on crossing routes or just running the ball. Uh, in a variety of ways that they just couldn't stop. So the, trying to understand a path to just getting SEC wins was tough. Now you see more after this game of, okay, here's a blueprint. It's not a guarantee that you'll beat all these teams, but you're putting yourself in a lot better position now than you would have previously. Uh, I, I'm really interested to see how they play against Mississippi State because if you're able to not just carry this momentum, but – pick out the things that really have worked for you and trust that against the team, the level of Mississippi state, as you continue to rise in competition, do they roll with it? Or are they still trying to make some of the things, whether it's personnel or scheme that they wanted to work early in the season? Are they trying to still make that work? Uh, are they making more wholesale changes with it uh, as they did on Saturday night? I'll be interested to see, but uh, I do think, and we both have said it, I feel a lot better about this team and their chances of winning yeah. some games now than I did on Saturday morning. Yep, definitely. Well, I think that'll wrap it up, Shane, unless you have some some something else to, to throw at us uh, on the Sunday go. morning. Ready to go. Um, but thank you all for joining us, whether it's on YouTube, whether it's on Spotify, whether it's on Apple. Feel free to subscribe, uh, send to a friend, share, like, uh, leave us a five-star rating on Apple. Um, I don't even know if there's any other rating system anywhere else, but leave us all the good ratings out there. Uh, thank you for joining us, and we'll talk to you all later.